Tassa and Buddhassa. Homage to you, the blessed and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Amo Saranto Suche Doye Olahudi San Miao San Putoshi. Namo Saranto Suche Doye Alahadi Samel San Putoshi. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Che Nan Zao Yu. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in a billion eons, but now we see and hear it and accept it reverently, may we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, good evening. Welcome to our Sutra Lecture tonight. It's good to see everybody here. This is December 1st. We're in Berkeley, California, downtown dead center Berkeley, and we're lecturing on the Flower Garland Sutra, the Ten Stages chapter, the Ten Grounds chapter. So that's a good thing to do, and we're glad you're here with us. If you would turn, please, to the front cover of your text here, we're going to uh, invoke the Buddha's presence musically. Chinese, it's there on the cover. Sounds good to the Buddhists. Huh? Having everyone's voice uh, strong is, is really a rare and special sound. All right. Um, tonight we are also blessed with lots of, from individuals that make this event happen. For example, we have a Vietnamese translation happening up in the balcony, thanks to kind hearted volunteers who turn out week after week so that those who prefer to hear the Dharma in Vietnamese can hear it. You know, actually, we're working on a Spanish translation. You know, like, all we have to do, Cubano Spanish is fine, Mexican Spanish is fine, Castiliano is fine. So I bet if we just announced it, I bet we would have 10 folks here listening happily to Spanish. You know, first week, and then 20, and then 30. So. And we also have a Chinese translation, thanks to 
two individuals in particular in Australia who are hearing my English and then putting it into a microphone which goes across the great Chinese firewall. So, okay. Lovely. I was told by uh, Madalena, uh, by, did we, I guess we reported that, that we, this time in China, we had a great an amazing discovery that um, of the 1.2 million channels on WeChat, our Master Xuanhua channel ranks number seven out of a million, point two. Out of ten, ten, 10 million, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 10 million, 10 million. Number seven. And people are listening tonight on that very channel to us, thanks to the folks in Australia. How about that? So now, no, no reflection on me or Berkeley. That's completely Master Xuan Hua's drawing power. But we'll take it, by golly. That was Shurfu's wish, was to um, do whatever, go where people's eyes and ears go to speak the Dharma. And a lot has been coming up to my mind recently about the, the uh, three periods predicted for the Dharma. The period of the, the right Dharma is flourishing and the period of the Dharma image, semblance, not the real thing, but a facsimile. And then the Dharma's ending age. Known to the Hindu, if, if the whole group of Indian religions known collectively as Hindu religions, talk about the Kali Yuga. Same idea. Same notion that there is a time when the teachings weaken and vanish, ultimately. And yet, here we are, 10 uh, WeChat sites in China and our very own strong, robust YouTube channel, thanks to hardworking volunteers who sit behind computers and make it happen and answer questions and keep track and all that stuff. So is that the Dharma ending age? I don't think so. It's a whole new day. It's a new dawn. So how nice. Much appreciated. Good indeed. And we have a new Christmas tree. Twinkling and blinking. There was one. We had a Buddha ornament at the top. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to, somebody have to go find one. <laughs> Joy to the world, the Buddha's awake. Let living beings please the king. Hmm. Why not? Chi whiz. You know what? Oh, son of a gun. We could tonight, since the Christmas tree is here, you have in your singing the Dharma songbook, you have Dharma carols. Don't touch it now. Wait, wait. <laughs> Not yet. Save that for dessert. First, you have to eat your green beans. They make you strong. Then we get to the ice cream and pie. So... Nice Christmas tree. If we, who can come up with a Buddha, what's that called? The top ornament, the, the crowning ornament. Santa Claus, he looks a little bit like Maitreya, right? He's got that bag, you know. <laughs> Please turn to page 58 and 59. Down at the bottom, the bottom paragraph. Tonight is going to call on some real focus to make sense of. Not that. Nah, that's that's not right. This is a very interesting description, especially for anybody who's interested in psychology. We're 
down in the bottom two lines of page 58. Everybody see that? Let's, we can do the whole thing. We'll do two lines on 58 and flip over to the two lines on 60 in Chinese. Then we'll come back and do it in English. We ready? Here we go. Tsi Pusa. Ru Shi Zhi. Zhong Sheng Xin Xiang. I'm sorry, my mistake. Zhong Sheng Xin Zhong Zhong Xiang. So we. Za Qi Xiang. Su Zhuan Xiang. Huai Bu Huai Xiang. Wu Xing Zhi Xiang. Wu Bian Ji Xiang. Qing Jing Xiang. Go Wu Go Xiang. Fu Bu Fu Xiang. That was, as it should be a second tone. Fu Bu Fu Xiang. Yeah. Fu Bu Fu. Ah, say Fu Bu Fu Xiang. Here we go. Yeah. 换所作相，随诸去生相，汝是百千万亿，乃至无量，皆如是之。Okay, back to page fifty-nine. <coughs> you ready to read together? We're going to do our unison reading. Look at the punctuation to know when to breathe. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? This bodhisattva knows the reality of sentient beings' various mental attributes, namely, the attribute of mixed arising, the attribute of swift turning, the attribute of harm or non-harm, the attribute of formlessness, the attribute of boundlessness, the attribute of purity, the attribute of defilement or non-defilement, the attribute of being bound or not being bound, the attribute of the effect of illusions, and the attribute of being reborn in all the destinies. He knows the reality of these attributes be they hundreds or thousands, or tens of thousands, or tens of thousands of kotis, up to limitlessly many attributes. Well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Do you all get that much? Right? Piece of cake, huh? So what are we talking about? Just to reiterate, we have a, a bodhisattva, an awakened being, who is a uh, high-level Bodhisattva, this is somebody who's not a beginner. He or she, gender-free, is working hard towards an ultimate goal of being a Buddha, but has already decided that the road to Buddhahood has to do with teaching other people first. At this point in his or her education, there, he's, she's, just use your own pronoun. He's, um, he needs to know how to teach. And he's focusing on thoughts. If I know what you're thinking, it's easier to teach you how to stop hurting yourself. There you go. There's a bodhisattva thought. Bodhisattva-like thought. The bodhisattva sees us more clearly than we see ourselves. And a lot of what he sees breaks his heart because the, there's, there's a great uh, Dharma-coded phrase, ranku wei le. We defile, and as ran is to stain. We stain, we, we, how do you say, dirty up suffering. The carpet needs vacuuming. Did you know that? Thank you. Please go to sleep again. My goodness. So, 
rank uwele, mistaking what is actually miserable as pleasant, enjoyable, desirable, fun. So think Las Vegas. Now, if anybody, like, I mean, I don't want to spoil Las Vegas. It's where it's America's playground, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what kind of America goes to Las Vegas to play, but that's, it's, let's, just, let's not name Las Vegas. It could be, you know, Reno, or it could be Monte Carlo. It could be uh, Cochiwa Casino. Doesn't matter. We go in thinking this time for sure. <laughs> there goes the car. Oh, there goes the house. Oh, there goes my kids' education. Oh, you know. Which gambler goes into the bet thinking for sure I'm going to lose? Not very often, right? It's like, luck be a lady tonight. Luck be a lady tonight. Luck, if you've ever been a lady to begin with, luck be a lady tonight, right? <laughs> luck, wow, <sighs> right? And what do you do? People, I don't know if you've ever known a real gambler, people who have the disease, it's a disease. It's actually a social, it's a, an actual syndrome. Um, people lose their lives and their families' lives. And then they go borrow money from their friends. And because why? It's just that one more roll when I'll strike it rich. This is the one. And that's Ranku Wela, right? Oh, boy. What's really suffering, you think, is pleasurable. So if the Bodhisattva can see the way we do that, he has a chance. He knows how to, just like a good doctor, he knows how to prescribe thoughts that counter when those thoughts rise. Um, this, this is tangential. We haven't actually, let's see, let's get the first sentence, then we'll go. This bodhisattva knows the reality of sentient beings, various, that sh the being should have a, a comma, not a, an apostrophe, an apostrophe after the S. Beings, plural, S, right? Various mental attributes. What is a mental attribute? Thought. This bodhisattva knows how we think. And then it gives us 10 really subtle descriptions of, of how we think, only from somebody who was like looking dead on, straight at the inner workings of the mind. These are subtle. And this bodhisattva knows them just as they are, for real. For real, he knows them. OK, so we had a family in Malaysia. Oh, -ho. and his family was wealthy. The father had, I think, come from Hong Kong at some point, or maybe from, might have been from Fujian. And he was a. a uh, uh, I think he did uh, import-export, and then he did real estate. And he was, uh, and also he had money from uh, an ancestor as well. And he apparently, and he was, this guy was a Buddhist, and so was his wife, but one of their sons seemed to be determined to destroy the family. And from they, they raised him like a little prince because he was wealthy. And at a certain point, I think he went, they sent him to England to get educated. And they got bad news at a certain point that he was spending all his time in Côte d'Azur and, and, you know, Monte Carlo, and uh, is that where Prince Grace, Grace Kelly was Monte Carlo? And in, you know, and going into the, the casino and playing Baccarat and coming out $100,000 poorer every evening, you know. And he kept asking for money, asking for money, and because he was their, their little balbe, they kept giving him money. And finally, at one point, they brought him back home. 
And he didn't stop. And at this point, it was, you know, it hit the news because the family had to uh, do something because they were, they were about to go bankrupt. And it was one of their four kids who just uh, poured the money into a black hole, you know, like that. And it was gambling. And he would go into the nightclub and place his bets, place his bets, time and time again. And you could see, they, they said, they described it. Why do we know this? It's because one of the, I guess it was the mom, came to Shurfu, came to Master Hua, and said, Shurfu, Shurfu, save us. We can't stop him. And Shurfu looked into it. And he told, actually, uh, told some of the background story because it was such a tragedy. And finally, the family had to, I forget what they finally did, but they, they wound up selling their house and they had to live very modestly because he did gamble it all away. And Shifu said, you know, the, he looked into it, and I don't know the details, but it was something to the extent that in the past, they, uh, I think it was the father, had ruined someone else uh, in business by cheating. He did something with their shipping. It was in a past life, and it was deliberate on his part, and it took a period of time. It wasn't one shot and done. But he had ruined the reputation of a businessman and then also taken all his money as well. So uh, Master Hua says, this is, this, this is now your son. He's back. He's your son. And sadly, he said, you've got it coming. However, he said, your work inside the Dharma is substantial. You, you've paid back a lot of it. You have good views. He said, if you're honest and kind-hearted, you can make it again. You'll make it again because you're, you're a skillful businessman. But you have to stop uh, using your skills to hurt other people, he said. And so the family uh, you know, came in. We saw them. They, were, they bowed and bowed and bowed. And after all of the money was used up, the young man, I forget, he, I think he just disappeared. He went out, maybe became a tennis bum or something like that, but he just kind of vanished. Didn't, didn't write letters, stopped gambling. And it was so precise that he gambled it all away. And all this wealth that they had was gone. And once they were reduced to basically you know, wages, wage earning, he stopped and kind of vanished. So we're, I'm watching this, and I had never met a gambler who had that disease. And you can see this person, he was possessed. It was just, you know, oh, no, no, please, more. I, you know, you know, I'll put it all on nine, you know, and lost it all and didn't blink. Bet again. So that's the kind of thoughts that our bodhisattva is able to see and counter. How would you do it? If you, you know, well, this is, those are very painful stories if you're in the family watching this happen to, it's, it's a lot like alcohol addiction. Same, you know, it ruins families if you have a gambler. This bodhisattva knows, notice that word that popped up ten times, attributes. What's an attribute? Well, the Chinese is the word xiang. And wow, have we worked on this word. This is popping up in our other Avatamsaka translation uh, group. And we've, this, the word xiang here covers a lot of bases. It goes everything from sign, give us a sign. You know, I've seen the signs, and the signs say, stop. You know, yield to pedestrian crossing. That's a sign. Yeah, you read the sign, and you know what needs to be known here. But 
it's more than just simply a sign. It's also things like characteristic. So the characteristic of golden retrievers is a mellow temperament, right? Wagging tail, don't bite you. They'll lick you to death before they bite you, right? The characteristic of ice cream is it's cold and sweet. Okay, characteristic of pepper is its hot and pungent flavor. So those are characteristics, features. Translate this word as features also. Um, some of the other ones, Jinchuan, we had um, Connie, what was it? Quality. And there was another one? Appearances. Right, right, meaning just the surface. Right, quality and, char and characteristic are pretty much the same. But appearance, meaning how it looks to the eye. Okay, so this is, the Sanskrit word is lakshana, which covers pretty much all of those. But in Buddhism and in tonight, I believe, to my mind, this is, there's a specific use of this word. It says, xin zhong zhong xiang, mind or thought, Zhong Zhong is variety of, multiple kinds of Xiang. I think Xiang here is referring to objects of the senses, things the senses recognize. So the Xiang of the eye would be sights. A Xiang that the ear detects are sounds in all their variety, high pitch, low pitch, coarse, fine, extended, resonant, muffled, brief, right, sounds. The xiang of the nose or smells, the xiang of the tongue or flavors, the xiang of the body are sensations of touch, and the xiang of the is it now. The, if you go by my scheme so far, when we get to the mind, we have to use e. This is xin, a little different, so the things that the e, e shi, the sixth consciousness, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, are, you'd say, dharmas. That's the traditional description, small d, dharma, meaning phenomena, stuff the mind knows. What does the mind know? Well, included thoughts, as well as what? Also emotions, also intuitions, also memories, dreams, and reflections, right? So. What is a xiang of a xin? What are the characteristics, the, the objects that a xin would know? That's what it's talking about. And it's kind of like if the Buddha was going to say, hey, let's talk about thoughts. How do you experience your thoughts? Let me say, well... When they arise, they're mixed up. So wait, that is to say, zachi. Mixed za is like not not pure, not single, but mixed. So a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm both happy and I'm also sad at the same time. It's bittersweet. Right? Seeing your child grow up must be really bittersweet because he used to be so innocent and predictable and seeing your kid become a teenager we don't have any teenagers here I'm glad we don't so we, I can say things that yeah so right when when teenagers become aliens right in front of your eyes you know they are our, our current teenagers are grown-ups already but when you were 13 when I was 13 I was an alien man I was like the nastiest 13 year old. I, I was famous for what was called talking back. Go to your room, make me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're grounded, says who? You know? <laughs> I think you can hear, I do that too well, right? So, yeah. Boy, grounded. Ooh. So that's za, and a parent loves her kid, but hates her kid. You know, what a, uh, anybody want my teenager? <laughs> Going cheap. <laughs> I'll pay you, in fact. So. Ah. 
how bittersweet that is, right? Because why are you behaving that way? Why are you asking? So, Mixed arising, bittersweet, right? Uh, um, there's, oh, what's that wonderful? Um, anybody, the movie Mean Girls? Yes. Right? Okay. So, so you, I mean, you, you know, shared symbol bank, right? The first day, Katie, right? Katie is going through the high school cafeteria for the first day. Remember? And she sees the, uh, the angry nerds. No, the Chinese nerds. Remember? They're host- there was hostile Chinese nerds. Hostile Asian nerds, right? What was it? The cool Asian but hostile. Okay. Then there's the jocks, and the jocks are like pounding their heads on each other, right? And uh, then there's the stoners, and they're like, you know, and then there's the girl who's eating her feelings. Remember? She's eating, there's a, a girl who who's obviously loves food, and she's like talking to her sandwich as she eats it. And she, you know, and she's like letting everybody see that she really doesn't care, but she, you know, oh, nom, nom. And she's eating her feelings. And I thought, man, that is so good. You know who that is? That's Tina Fey. Tina Fey's the writer. That's, people know Tina Fey. She's right on. I mean, that's, there you go. Mixed arising. She knows she shouldn't and she's gonna. And so she's, you know, she's having her feelings for lunch. It's not just food. Boy, can I identify. So, mixed arising, right there. The attribute of swift turning. How quickly thoughts rise and fall. Zoom. Anger. Whew. Swift. And interesting, it's Juan, right? Su Juan. How they turn. Now that's, that's a, this is actually a technical description. Um, we don't do thoughts the way the Theravada does thoughts. I didn't, I haven't heard all of Kubodi's lectures, but the Abhidharma is where this stuff lives. This is probably Abhidharma, my guess is. A lot of these, you can probably trace them right to the Abhidharma. These, this is Sanskrit-based, and the Abhidharma is Pali. But what is the Abhidharma? It's the in the Pali canon, we have this, the Chinese canon from the Sanskrit. The Pali canon does not have Lun. It doesn't have Shastras. It's got Abhidharma. So it's Sutras, Vinaya, and Abhidharma. Our canon here has Sutras, Vinaya, Shastras, commentaries. Right? The Abhidharma clocks the mind. Yanlin, did you, were you there for Bhikkhu Bodhis? This detailed description of the turning of the mind. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's from somebody who's done a what? Done a lot of time watching their mind. They watch the thought moments. You know, and here it is. So swift turning. They talk about how thoughts go twee. They rise and they fall. Rising, falling. The, um, there's that very helpful, I find, very helpful phrase in the Vipassana world. It says, everything that rises in the mind ceases in the mind. That's very helpful. Everything that rises in the mind ceases in the mind. And that's not theory, that's observation. That's experience talk. Now, what is that? That is liberating from all kinds of affliction in the mind. You say, yeah, it's rising, but you know what? There was a time before it arose, there will be a time after. Watch. Right? The Buddha doesn't say, believe me. He says, experience it. Rising, falling. Right? So, that's very helpful. Swift turning. The attribute of harm or no harm. Now, what is, how do you get these? There's one, 
two, defilement, no defilement, bound, not bound. There are three of those um, both sides. And there's, this is profound seeing of subtle attributes of thoughts. And I think, how, how does that work? I think it's because thoughts don't rise independently. They arise connected. And it takes, <coughs> at certain times, you can have conditions that lead, same thought can lead to harm, same thought can lead to no harm. But it's the thought itself. There's a, I just realized something. Looking at the Sanskrit, that hoi translates to a Sanskrit word banga, which is actually disillusion. So the kind of the, um, the disillusion of the thought. So it's actually interesting. I realize this is on the, on the mental attribute, the kind of the thoughts. It's like the turning and then the, the, the disillusion of the thought. Just thought that was interesting. So you say dissolution, meaning... The, it's just breaking up, yeah, the disillusion, dissolve. dissolve. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, breaking okay. disillusion. Okay, so um, rising, falling, okay, we said that. So how do they, um, there are four attributes of worlds. Cheng, zhu, huai, kong. They come into being. They sustain themselves, they go bad, and they're gone. And they come into being again. So it's cheng zhu huai kong cheng. Because there's no, nature doesn't do vacuums. Once it's kong, it begins again. So that third one, huai, is decay. So this could be, instead of harm or non-harm, it could be de the destruction or non-destruction of a thought. That third phase. If you just said it makes sense with the order, chen, uh, chen, zhu, huai, kong, the, and then the formlessness, mm -hmm. the next, so that makes a lot of sense. So here's, here's the Buddha looking at the mind and saying, I'll give you an attribute of thoughts. They are formless. Who would recognize that? Yeah. But not always. But they do, they can have that xiang, that thing by which you know them. What's the point of calling these attributes? This is ways, you, ways we know stuff. If you can see it, you can know it. If you can hear it, you can know it. If you can smell it, taste it, touch it, you can know it. You can think it, it's knowable. Those are the xiang by which we know. So this is all part of, here's, here's a really useful word, epistemology. Episteme is knowledge that is categorized. So language comes from that. This is Latin. So epistemology is, how do we know stuff? Well, I heard it. Well, she told me. Well, I read it. Well, it just, I had the intuition, and it was true. How we know things. Right, comes in through knowledge, comes in through the eyes, the ears, none, nose, tongue, body, mind. So this is, thoughts have that quality of knowability. That's how we know stuff. How do you know stuff? How do you know not to put your fingers in the flame on the stove? Because last time he did it, ouchie, right? You don't, you don't burn your fingers twice. Once burned, twice shy, right? You don't do it again. You learn. Now the parent, there's bittersweet. Do you let the kid burn their own fingers or do you tell them? Don't do that, sweetie. <laughs> why not, mom? <laughs> That's why. Oh, well, maybe better the kid does it once for herself instead of mom trying to protect the baby from everything. You know, who knows? You know what they say? They say eating a little bit of dirt is good. <laughs> Don't eat that, it's dirty. You know, no, if kids eat dirt, and guess what? They get all kinds of antibodies and resistance. Dirt makes us strong. <laughs> so, who would think? 
right? Mom wants to protect the child. No, let me do a bit of dirt's a good thing. You, it gives you strong digestion locally. So things you wouldn't know if you didn't come to the monastery. You know what the Dharma master said last night? He said, we should be eating dirt. No, I didn't say that. I said, oh, well, never mind. Formlessness, the attribute of boundlessness, no fence. It's not only formless, it's not triangular, it's not square, it's not 3D, but it doesn't have any boundary. It goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes, you know. The attribute of purity of thoughts. He knows it as it really is. He can look at thoughts and go, yep, that thought is not mixed with anything. He knows it. If he can find it, he knows it. The attribute of go, wu go, xiang. So coming off of purity, now that thought is stained. Go here is like defiled or stained or not pristine anymore. It's a, a crooked thought. Then, thoughts that are bound. And again, think of it in, in relation to other thoughts. Um, thoughts that when they meet certain situations, they get all tied up. When they're in other situations, the ties are undone. They're, they're free. Um, I have to say, I, I saw one. Um, when I was uh, in my seventh year of my PhD program, I embarked on my dissertation. And three years later, finally succeeded. And it took a lot, a lot of effort to get that document finally written. And there were three people here at BBM who, uh, who pretty much gave me hours and hours and hours of time every week. And uh, Dr. Nakasone, uh, my advisor, was so generous in saying, all right, Hunkshire, come on down to my house. You gotta work on chapter four. And I would drive down to Fremont and sit in his kitchen and he would pour tea and he would criticize my sentences. And he would say, you know what's wrong with chapter four? I said, well, it's taken me about six months. Yeah, you don't need it, throw it out. <gasps> no, what? No, no, it's better without it. But, but Sensei, it, it's, it, I spent six months on that. No, no, it's better, no, you don't need it. You could maybe publish it later as a book, but just get rid of it now. So, you know, get rid of it. Sure enough, it helped it immediately. But he kept on giving his advice. And the point of this is to say, I've seen my classmates who didn't get that help that I got. And they are, the rest of their lives, ABD, all but dissertation. And something like 40% of the people who start out, maybe more, start out in, on their doctoral programs, wind up almost. And I was looking, I was thinking about what a difference it makes to have accepted the help of some people who are in the room here tonight who helped me get through that experience. And so now, even though in a class of 50, if I was 49th in terms of achievement, you know what they call you when you walk across the stage and hand you your, your diploma? Doctor. And I made it, and I am Dr. Reverend Dharma Master. <laughs> but only because those people selflessly took their time to get me through, including my advisor. And man, what a difference. 
So this bound or not being bound, when I see my friends who have to say, oh yeah, I did some graduate school. Further study needed, you know. What's the difference? They didn't, just that little bit, that little bit of help when your strength wasn't enough, you know. And what a difference. So being unbound by having to say, mm, yeah, I, oh, ABD, all but dissertation, so no doctorate, you know. But then, uh, done, PhD, piled higher and deeper. What a difference. So the attribute of, check this one out, ready? Huan, huan, so, zuo, xiang. The attribute of suffering illusor, illusions work. Like getting the effects of illusion. What an amazing perception of thoughts the Buddha has. He's seeing how right in the middle of what we think is really the case is not the case. Right? It's illusory. It looks real, it's not. Subtle, huh? And yet these attributes, find one, hand it to me. They're all Juan Ru Juan. They're like illusion. Some are actually illusory. Not the case. Okay? So, how do we know what is the case? The answer is stories. Stories we hear. If you grow up in a house where nobody reads, language doesn't mean the same to you as a house where books are talked about, are left around, are checked in and out of the library, are discussed, right? Uh, my Jewish friends. Oh, ah, no, speaking of which, who was it? Where, it wasn't, no, who was it? Shoot, I forget exactly where it was. We're talking about a musician. Oh, Al, was it Alex Degrassi, I think? who was saying that he is playing with a tabla player. It wasn't Zakir Hussein, uh, one of the great tabla players. And they said that when he was in the womb, his mother put a set of tablas on her tummy. <laughs> so he's been a musician since before he came out, right? Played the tablas on his own. So, some people, you know, have have these qualities uh, built in. But the um, how do you how do you distinguish between what is just an attribute, and yet it's not illusory, and the illusory something the effect of illusions. It's all stories. If you've been told, or let's say if you have not been told, that words matter. When you grow up, a lot of doors don't open to you. There's something called Tai Jiao, right? In the Chinese world, people know about Tai Jiao, where you deliberately read to your pregnant Stomach before the child comes out. So the kid is in there, conscious and alert and listening. Before the child arrives, he or she has already heard words, language, poetry, di zi gui, san zi jing, bai jia xing, qin zi wen. You know, the kid has learned all that stuff before they come out. They're all ready for second grade by the time they're <laughs> nine years old. You know, they're nine months old and they're ready for bu xi ban. Oh. Well, xin shuan shu, ayya, gang qin, ying yu bu xi ban. Yeah, so Chinese parents are amazing in their willingness to give the kid exposure to every kind of attribute so that 
So, but what if you grow up in a family where mostly what you hear from your dad is, shut up. I don't want to hear that. Drop that. Right? Every, everything, every utterance from the male in your family is said in anger and brief. And mostly it's four-letter words. Right? What happens to those centers in the brain? I remember an article, it was in Newsweek magazine. This was years ago. The uh, topic was, um, L, uh, was uh, natal education, uh, training babies. And the research showed that there's a center somewhere in the frontal lobe where language grows. And if a family takes the child and Jewish families are famous for this, Chinese families are famous for this, taking the child at a very, very early age and showing him language, the formation of words, and letting the kid not talking, oh, it's a, oh, it's a baby, oh, who's a good kid, oh, it's so sweet. Not like that, it's like, yeah, how are you feeling this morning? You know, are, would you like to, uh, are you interested in a PhD program? Should we enroll you in Yale? You're young, but... You know, it's not too early. If, if you give the kid, don't, don't go to Stanford, okay? Greed, we don't go to Stanford, right? right? So, Cal, but more, you know. So if you level the kid's eyes on the parents or the adult's face speaking language, there's a center in the brain that goes from pea size to walnut size by age three. That is where language develops. Once the, right, Tina, is this, this is research that you all used to talk about, right? Experts in, in childhood education. So if the family does not train the child with language, by age three, it's still pea size. And at a certain point, it won't grow any further, and the child is actually crippled when it comes to acquiring vocabulary and concepts. So how important is it to give the child exposure to that, form, that, that place where language can grow? It's just between ages, you know, in the womb to three, you build the capacity then the rest of the life, the kid is acquiring the functions there. So there's no, no, no surprise why Lowell High School <laughs> is mostly a Chinese high school, right? The merit school, because Chinese families have done that, tai jiao, that notion that language is one, culture and language are the shared treasure of civilization. So, Zhong Wen, what power did Chinese language have to tame the barbarians? Everybody who came to Chang'an became Chinese, no matter what. And then Luoyang, and then Hangzhou, and then Beiping, and then Beijing, and every, they, you know, the Mongolians came running in, and they became Chinese. The Manchurians came running in, they became Chinese. Boy, oh boy, Chinese language had a lot to do with that. Because you have these kids who know things. They, their attributes are solid and grounded in things that are identifiably belonging to the Middle Kingdom. Right? That just, and then you, then you go, okay, baby, ready? One, E, two, R, three, San. And the kid's going, hmm, you know, print, print print, you've just connected to 5,000 years of continuous cultural identity. Pretty stable. Not confused about what it means to be Chinese. No matter whether you go to Malaysia or Philippines or San Francisco or New York, you're still Chinese. You know. So, the attribute of the effect of illusions and non-illusions, right? 
And the last one is interesting. The attribute of being reborn in all the destinies. So, my goodness, what is it indeed that takes us out of our human bodies and plops us into a goat's body or plops us into a parrot's body or a goldfish's body or a ghost's non-body? Yeah, what is that? It's thought-based. Shurfa would say that the, the mind is the center of all ten Dharma realms. Those thoughts have power. And you can see if you're... Now, this is this Bodhisattva... Um, was it a couple stages back when they... You know, it was last one, when they got the ten powers working for them. Right? The ten powers has the... Includes the one where you say... Uh, you... Know where all paths lead. Right? Where the, you see with a single look, you know where this action will take you. That's an ability that a te- good teacher has. So, the, the attribute of being reborn in all the destinies, not all at once, but individually, and you can see where the thoughts go. Wouldn't it be amazing if every thought that we had had a little label on it? Uh Uh-oh, hungry ghost thought, (laughs) watch out. Oh, Davis thought, really good. Wow, Bodhi Resolve, bing, prize, the big prize. Bodhi Resolve. We don't, right? They get all mixed up. And if if you didn't hear the sutras, you wouldn't know that these thoughts are super active. These thoughts are the power are in thoughts. And mm, say, I'm going to not scold my mom so much. I'm not going to nag my husband so much. You know? I'm going to kind of be let up on myself more. I'm not going to use profanity when I talk to myself. I'm not going to yell at myself. Why? Those thoughts are active. If you do it all the time, where do they lead us? So, yeah, that would be interesting. If every, we had kind of like color-coded thoughts based on that six-pole path. And, whoa. Buddha's thoughts. Bingo. So, yeah, Jerry. The difference between attribute and F-O-R-M? So the, the person has said, could, could I give examples of the difference between attributes and form? Right? Okay, a form would be a cookie, Christmas cookie cutter. Stump. What have we had so far? This, this, we've, I've seen stars. What else? I haven't seen, what are they? Snowflakes. Snowflakes. Okay, snow. What, what was the third one? Pikachu Christmas cookie? A, you eat Pikachu Christmas cookies? My God. There's a hell thought right there. You're killing. You know. So, no, I'm kidding about that. So, what, what, yeah, what flavor does Pikachu come out? Pumpkin spice Pikachu cookies. Hmm, shame on you. She is. I guess the snowman, you could say the same thing, right? You're killing that snowman. So, okay, a cookie cutter is a form. The flavor of the cookie that comes out is an attribute. Next question. Wasn't that good? Do you like that? Okay, the, the shape of the, let's see, the pen that you're writing with is the form. I guess the alphabet, the alphabet that you're writing, A, B, C, D, E, is the form the word you communicate is the attribute. Yes, sir. Is he describing these attributes as a kind of examples from a conventional reality? 
to help us uh, better understand the ultimate reality, which I think mm. you could call like uh, wisdom of uh, non-discrimination. The wisdom of non-discrimination. Uh, right. So what, if, if you would run that by one more time, I think you're on, I'm totally with you, but I wanted to hear it one more time. So he's giving these examples of different xiang. All ten, in this case. From, that we may understand from conventional reality. Right. To give us a better uh, window into ultimate okay. reality. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. yeah. So, um, I think so. The, the sutra is here describing, let, let me, you know, is it this way? Uh, this is how I make sense of it. The sutra is opening up a window in the head of John Q. living being, right? The average living being. And then it shows us through that window what the bodhisattva is seeing as he goes about trying to, to change the thinking of living beings so that they turn away from confusion and go towards Bodhi. So, okay, in that case, it's got an instructive function. But at the same time, if we were to go, I'm, I'm convinced that if we were to go deeper into these 10, these are not random 10, we would be able to see the unproduced, what is beyond words and thought. So, yeah, uh, we're just scratching the surface. Basically, we're just kind of like, do we understand the word level? But why, you know, why, let's see, here, let, let's wrap it up and then come back here. He, she knows the reality of these attributes, be they hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of kotis, up to limitlessly many of them. All right. Not only is the Bodhisattva interested in, is the Sutra teaching us how the Bodhisattva recognizes us? Because are you with me on page 61? Look at the second paragraph. Oh my God, how many attributes? <laughs> attribute, 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 attribute. Okay, so there's more to go. Not only is he showing us these attributes that are knowable by the ninth stage Bodhisattva, but at the same time, I believe if you take them and look at the qualities that he's described, you get to a place where you see the field these attributes arise in, which is to say empty space. And what's the purpose of this preamble here? The Bodhisattva in the ninth stage is going to Dharani. That's what's coming up. That's kind of the main um, tool that is being trained here. What is Dharani? Mantras, sounds. This is about sound. And because in a minute, not in a minute, in a week or two, the Bodhisattva is going to talk about answering doubts in living beings, the severing, dissolving, dispelling doubts, and clearing up the, these problems from their minds so that they get closer to their own nature. That's, that's coming up. So, let's... So thank you for that. I think I, there is definitely that other level. We, we haven't even pointed to it yet. What about Freud? You were probably asking yourself that very question today, right? right? What about Freud? Yeah, what about Freud? Freud says, you know, so how long have you been having this problem? Describe it to me. Very interesting and crazy. Yeah, you know, the talking cure, psychoanalysis, is dependent upon language entirely for the, the analysan, the person who's getting analyzed, to be able to say what's wrong, so that the, and put it in language, so that the doctor, the an analyst, can hear it and then go, oh, I see, you know. And then connect it to something and then go to the textbook, I believe we have a problem, schizophrenia. 
or, you know, whatever. And it's crude. And it, it was wonderful. I mean, there was nothing like it. But how raw, you know, it's like you're, you're depending upon the, how widely read the analyst is. You're depending upon the patient being able to say what they're feeling and not be embarrassed, not be ashamed, not, not have any of those. And then the dangers involved of the, the patient gets attached to the analyst. And there's that thing called transference, you know, and then you have to end this, the therapy, you know. It was a start. It was a beginning. But compared to Buddhist psychology, look at this. I mean, here's the Bodhisattva in the ninth stage talking about the subtle turnings of thoughts. And <coughs> how one could be decaying or not decaying depending. And there are alt alternates happening here. This is profound insight. This is real insight. And when I make this available to people who've studied psychology or psychiatrists, they go, where has this been? Well, how's your Chinese? Well, I don't speak well, so please, you know, enjoy. <laughs> Here it is. We're trying. We're trying to get it into shape so that people can read it and go, I had no idea. I thought the Buddha was the peace guy. In fact, the Buddha was a profound psychotherapist. He understood himself, herself. You know. Can I understand myself? Sure. Sit down and meditate. You too. Because it's not outside. It's, this is the mind cleared of defilement and confusion and attachment. How about that? This, this is exciting stuff. And it just continues to open. Any more questions there, Jerry? How many people are on tonight? Five, five? OK. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can we pass her the mic? So the uh, Bodhisattva said the attributes of defilement or non-defilement, the attribute of being bound or not being bound, um, it seems like the Bodhisattva is not explicitly saying this, but is he or she referencing to duality? Uh, definitely. Because these are, the, as, I, as I read it, the Bodhisattva is describing what he or she sees in our minds. Duality. The question, tell me your name again. Doug? Don. Don's question said, the, the, he didn't say in so many words, but he, what he was saying was, there's all of these uh, attributes are within duality but by pointing them out, perhaps in the combination or in the, the setting that they've been pointed out, there, when that's understood, what appears is the non-dual second level of truth. The, there's uh, some teaching, I know the Avatamska is one of them, where it talks about RD, it said. There's normal duality, relative truth, which is, well, black and white, true and false, right and wrong, yin and yang, male and female, night and day, relatively speaking. But then there's the second level, which is zhen di, the ultimate level of truth that the Buddha sees. We don't see that. And the trick is, not the trick, but the constant refrain that I'm always reminding myself is, don't assume that because the sutra gives us the insight through his eyes that that's the way you see it. 
stay humble. Recognize that what happened, when did that happen? When did the relative truth duality that is language and thought is bound up in it? When did it flip? It flipped at sixth stage. So the seventh, eighth, and ninth, tenth are all after that flip. And the real change happened last stage. Remember when the Bodhisattva had to cross that threshold, had to get to the, the crossroads and make it across? Some didn't, right? And the Buddhas come and urge him or her, keep going, keep going, keep going, don't stop. That's the ultimate transformation from consciousness to wisdom. That's non-duality. Consciousness and duality is still there and accessible, but for the Bodhisattva, they now can see the totality. So what would it be? We heard discriminating thought. What's this fun bie xin? What is discriminating thinking? Fun has eight, yiga ba zi, yiga dao zi, right? That Chinese character has an eight and a, a knife. And it's, think butcher knife, you know, Chinese cleaver, chopping up bai cai. Gonna make jiao zi, right? Like that. You, your knowledge comes from reductionism. You cut everything into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And then from the smallest, you can know the biggest. That's a standard scientific theorem, methodology. So that's what we do. We make it smaller and smaller, we can understand it. Wisdom goes different. Wisdom puts it all together. Wisdom finds the identity and the totality and the commonality of dharmas empties out the self, understands what are called the san fa yin, the three seals, they say it, the three things, the three dharmas that seal. Ku kong wu chang wu wo. They're unsatisfying, they're empty of self, they're short-lived, and they're not, they have no identity. So, empty, cool, cool, and also unsatisfying, impermanent, and not self. And when you see that permeating everything, Wisdom happens because it's always that case. Everything is. Conditioned dharmas are that way. So, but you have to really, 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 really flip over your mind. They say the eight consciousnesses become four wisdoms. That was, and it's a Chan experience, right? So the first five consciousnesses become one wisdom. The sixth becomes one. The seventh becomes one. The eighth becomes one. The eighth consciousness becomes Da Yuan Jing Zhi. Da Yuan Jing Zhi. The wisdom of the round, perfect mirror. That's your eighth consciousness when it flips over. Sandy. Um, how do you apply Ku Kong to family member? Like, how know. do you apply Ku Kong to a family member? Yeah, how do you look at family member from a place of wisdom and not condition, relativity, duality? Um, with every single thought, word, and deed, you're creating affinities with certain people and animals and, you know. So family members, well, I'll, instead of my theorizing about it. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like okay. um, yeah. family member with addiction, you mentioned gambling earlier, or alcohol, or drugs. Yep. Yeah. So ask it one more time. What's, I, I heard the ku kong, and how do you, and then you gave an example. Stitch it in together. Okay, so how to live in wisdom mm. 
in the context of a family structure, right. the relationship, because we are all related to somebody. Right. Um, let's say family member has an addiction, and what be it alcohol, gambling, drugs, shopping, mm -hmm. sugar, um, how to relate, be in this relationship from a place of wisdom, right. um, beyond duality, relativity of... Okay, got it. So, um, families who have someone in, in your, under your roof who uh, has destructive behavior, that's very hard on families. And one good, helpful suggestion is get help. Find support. Reach out. Because why? Uh, let's just talk about alcohol. Um, having a drunk in your family is shameful in many, many cultures. And it's hard to, to expose it. So many families enable it instead. They just listen to the lies and the promises and the lies and the promises of the person who's got that goy, that ghost on them. And if you've ever been around somebody who's really, really hooked, it's like a ghost. They're a different person in face to face with the substance. Right? So Families mostly let it go. Because why? Oh, it's so hard. When that ghost is on the person, they will fight. They'll do anything to get that substance in. And it takes, with counseling, with support, with help, there are methods that that can bring the family together. It can be a really unifier for the rest of the family. Not one person can yield. And the, the addict will know exactly who to go to, who hid the bottle out you know, in the garage. And they know, they know where it is. And they'll look because there's a lot riding on getting that bottle. So, if the family has got support and everybody says secretly getting you the stuff is not helping you and you're destroying our family, you're sick, we love you, we're going to get you treatment, right? That, that has to happen sooner or later. If it's later, you just measure the amount of destruction that happened on the path to finally facing and not enabling. It's really, really hard to do because you have to, it's just the same as having a family member with cancer. No different. It's a disease. Addiction is a disease. And it comes quietly and subtly, you know, before you know it. So uh, I think people know a lot more now about, let's say, alcoholic addiction than they did. And boy, oh boy, 10 steps, 12 steps, 12 steps program is really, really good. 12 steps program was, in, was created by a guy from Toledo, actually. Uh, what was his name? Bill Wilson, right? And Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. And it actually works. Now, it uses God. It uses Christianity because most people are. But it doesn't depend. And we have Kevin Griffin, who every month brings his recovery group here, using the Dharma to recover. Uh, Kevin is the author of, what's, what's his book? Yeah. For, it's a good, good title. Kevin is a good writer, as he, he and his wife are both writers. And uh, as he came from 
addiction and use the Dharma to get out of it. So the, the question is, you know, if it's a Chinese family and you have somebody who's got that illness, you don't tell anybody, you know, it's embarrassing. And one breath at a time. Religion, Buddhism and the 12 steps. Yeah. So that's alcohol, but it's the same for, for narcotics anonymous. Anyway, if you know, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to admit and to say, time to face it. Because why? This is your beloved brother, son, husband, daughter. You know, but it, it's, it's sooner or later. And the problem with drugs is if it's later, the kid could die. Because the drugs are poison. That's why they call them du, you know. And boy, man, oh man, with now with uh, fentanyl, 800 times stronger than heroin, and going to the private profit of one family, I might add, by the way, um, opioid crisis is profoundly profitable for one family that stays out of the limelight, owns the, the patent on those drugs. So the chances of waiting and losing your child are really good. The OD cases happen, the bodies stack up. And so once the, once the addiction happens, you face either losing the child or losing your reputation, but if you can be heroic and save the child by sacrificing the reputation, you give strength to other families. And it's, boy, is it hard. But there's actually a lot of money and attention now in therapy and rehab and strategies and uh, methods. And it brings the family together if you can all face it. Um, we just had uh, a couple whose son, uh, over a period of 10 years, put the parents through hell. And uh, they, of course, th these are very well-educated people and they meant the world. They wanted to give the world to their kid. And the kid just started on dope and worked his way up in heroin and then into other stuff and nearly destroyed the family before the, the husband and wife said, I'm not going to let you kill us. You're trying to kill us. And the kid didn't blink, didn't care, didn't care. It may well, if, if Scherfer would have seen it, he may have said, yeah, same old story as the gambler. I don't know. I don't have that vision. But the young man, they finally got a restraining order to keep the kid away from the family because he kept coming back. They said, we're out of this now. You either heal yourself. You come back. You come back clean. We will love you no less. We love you a lot. Stay away from us. They had to actually get the kid out of the house and at the same time, you know, tracking him to see if they could get him into rehab and have... He went 10 times to rehab and lied every single time, went back to using, broke the habit. Now employed, has a job, doesn't come back unless they invite him. And when they, they're now inviting him and he's coming back and he's not like throwing the sofa into the TV set the way he used to, you know. And so they came and just wanted to check in with, with me and Marty to see what what we thought, and it was a battle. It was a war, and it looks like they're winning because the kid didn't die, and he seems to have had a change of heart finally, but it took 10 years for them to go, this is nonsense. You know, we love you, dear. Stay away. So... If you still have your kid and they're addicted, get support. It's bigger than you. So, anyway, you ask.
dukkha, ku, that can turn to love. It can really turn to love. Love wins in the end if you apply tough love. You all have a songbook in front of you. If you turn to page 58, Now, the, the problem with this is most of you did not grow up with Christmas carols. You have to be a Protestant Christian for this to actually work. Before you go, ha, 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 that's really good, Dharma Master. You know, everybody else goes, hey, what's he singing about? His kind of mud? I think I'm supposed to like, hey, you know, <laughs> that's really good, right? So. O western land of utmost bliss, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. And in the dark night, and in the dark night striming the everlasting light, above our years, above the years, the sea, throughout the years, of all our fears, throughout the years, are met in thee tonight. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie, right? So here we go. O western land of utmost bliss, how pure we see thee lie. Your lotus flowers gave birth to us, our karma purified. The vows of Amitabha, the one of limitless light, saves everyone who saves his name, reborn in pure delight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At no time do my hands leave my wrist. Yes? I think that's a really good. Dharma Carol, myself. I, mean, I kind of like that. Okay. Uh, C, C, B, and here we go. This has to be the right pitch. There we go. Maybe E. Let's see. Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, so C, B, A. Here we go. Silent mind, holy mind, all is calm, all is bright. Deep be passionate, thoughts rise and fall. With clear insight, deep from them all, sit in heavenly peace, sit and contemplate. Do it again. Do we do it again? Just keep singing until your mind falls silent. Okay. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, right? You know that one? What is it in German originally? Oh, Tannenbaum. Oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum. So, oh, Zabaton, oh, Zabaton. What's a Zabaton? You're sitting on one. That's a Zabaton. This is a Zafu. This is a Zabaton. And what is it stuffed with? K-pop. This is not, this is carbon, uh, cotton batting, but it's K-pop, okay? So, now you've got the setup for the song. Ready? Let's see here. Uh, C, a D. Oh, Zabuton, oh, Zabuton, thy kindness is substantial. I sit upon thee day and night with folded legs and ankles. Thy kapok saves my knees from pain. 
through hot and cold you don't complain oh zabuton oh zabuton compassion's insulation there i got all that finally good some actual laughter that's good good okay what about here we come a wassailing upon the leaves so green here we come a wassailing so fair to be seen Love and joy come to you and to you, good wassail too. Uh, God send you a busy and happy new year. God send you a merry new year. Okay. So here we come to meditate, right? Uh, here we come to meditate among tea leaves so green. Here we come to meditate, so fair to be seen. Peace and joy come to you, please perfect your wisdom too. May the Buddhas bestow on you a happy new year. May they send you a happy new year. There you go, you heard it here first. Okay, turn over here. Now this one, this one is a little bizarre. This one requires, this one requires some knowledge of three steps, one bow. The scene is, there's a family on Christmas Day inside. They've just opened their presents. The turkey dinner is in the oven, and they've got football on two. And outside, they notice there are two monks bowing by on the sidewalk, like that. Okay, so this is the reaction. And it's, I saw two ships, which is one of the better Christmas carols. I saw two ships come sailing in on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I saw two ships come sailing on Christmas Day in the morning. Right? You know that one? You don't. I saw two ships. So here's, I saw two monks. Let's see here. I saw two monks come bowing there on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Dressed in robes, they had no hair on Christmas Day in the morning. I've watched them bow since after two on Christmas Day, on Christmas. They must have nothing else to do on Christmas Day in the morning. I've heard they bow for world peace on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. It says so on their press release on Christmas Day in the morning. The one in front, he would not speak on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. I never seen a stranger freak on Christmas Day in the morning. I wonder who they're bowing to on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Ask him, he won't answer you on Christmas Day in the morning. Two preachers came to hassle them on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. To endless hell they did condemn on Christmas Day in the morning. It's a true story, right? This is drawn from life, right? The monks kept bowing just the same on Christmas Day, on Christmas. The men of God looked pretty lame on Christmas Day in the morning. I bowed along the avenue on Christmas Day, on Christmas. Because my uncle dared me to on Christmas Day in the morning. On the spot I felt such peace on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Broad bark my heart release on Christmas Day in the morn. Bowing brought my heart release on Christmas Day in the morn. To my surprise I made a vow on Christmas Day, on Christmas Day. Every year I'm going to bow on Christmas Day in the morn. By golly, every year only once per year, thank goodness, it's the only time we bring these out. So, Anybody wants to, uh, you know, contribute to the Dharma carols, please do. There's a bunch that we can work on, Jingle Bells, or uh, I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, you know, there's a bunch of them, so, yeah. Uh, what else? Um, gee whiz. There, yeah. Deck the hall, deck, deck the hall with 
boughs of holly. No, deck the halls with uh, lot. Deck the halls with la 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 la. Let's see. Da, la, let's see. Jin Chuan snoring while he's sitting. Fa la 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 la. Don't awake him. He'll be upset. Fa la 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 la. Encourage him to get enlightened. Fa la 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 la. He did. Ah. So. Okay. So there we go. Um, the next time you hear from me will be from Australia on the tube. So next week we have Jin Forsher, Jin Chuanshir speaking. Maybe we can get, once his semester is over, we can get Jin Weishir into the rotation here. But I'm off to uh, Taiwan with Jin Hosher tomorrow, and then off to Australia. That you spell S-T-R-A-Y-A. Straya. If you're an insider, Straya. So I'm looking forward to finding out whether or not the Wi-Fi has improved. Sam, Cliff, how's the Wi-Fi set up there? There's too many what? Too many latencies, yeah. It, you could hear it. Echoes, 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 echoes. So we'll try to clean that up. So I'll be there before you know it, y'all. And we can do yy.com live instead of, yeah. So I will be sending uh, photographs of Ali and the possums and the snakes and the spiders and the birds. and the Assuming, you know, one of the disturbing things that has come across my radar recently I mentioned it a couple of months ago, but it's came back. Insects, Armageddon. When was the last time you cleaned the bugs off your windshield on a summer's drive? We don't do that anymore, do we? Off your windscreen, off your bumper. Why? 70% of the biomass of insects is gone. Just gone. Quietly, nobody noticed. It's, they're gone. And how many critters depend on those insects for food? Most of the birds? Lots and lots and lots. And people don't know now. They don't know what to say. Except, <laughs> this, is, this is not a cheerful thought. Nature has a way of forgiving. Bouncing back. Once the humans are gone, the bugs will all come back. <laughs> Because this is anthropogenic climate change, human-caused climate change. How funny, huh? Where are the bugs? In Australia, uh, five years ago when I was there at night, the, the night chorus was just... Now it's like... Echo. Even in Australia. So. I'm sorry, once again? Dead fish. They've eaten too much plastic. Yeah. So, anyway, just to say, just, you know, and that's a problem. That's a real, 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 real problem. Like honeybees, Montana. 85% of Montana's honeybees, honeybees are gone. And they're, they're trying because we, we, that impacts us directly because we depend on pollination. <sighs> yeah, anyway, so there's something to dedicate merit to. Let's go back to Jin Hosher. Calendars, calendars, calendars. This is calendar distribution night here at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. 2019 calendars, the, the uh, theme is lotuses from the CTTB Lotus Pond. Quite beautiful pictures from all from CTTB. The calendars have uh, the, all the dates for 2019. We would ask you please take one per family. 
if you know somebody who is not here who really wants one, we can happily give you two. But we want to be sure that any, everybody who wants one gets at least one. So if you don't mind. And if there's a, somebody gave a suggested donation, that's up to you. So, okay. Uh, transfer the merit. See you all from down under next. And you know what they say? How can we miss you if you won't go away? Right? So... Let's bow to the Buddhas and have a week full of blessings and wisdom.